one of the things we haven't discussed is international relations and specifically what's going on in Ukraine. And I wanted to, I've, I've seen so many headlines over the last few weeks. Uh, White House confirms plans to bring tanks, heavy weapon, weaponry to Russia's door. This is from Common Dreams. Uh, senior Putin aide warns Russia over, warns over Russia-U.S. relations. This is from the Financial Times. Uh, Russia-U.S. relations unlikely to improve. Uh, this is from the uh, Associated Press. Uh, Dateline Baku. I wanted to get Stephen Cohen, Professor Stephen Cohen, back on. Contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU and Princeton. Uh, author of his book, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, which examines the new Cold War, is just recently out in uh, reissued in paperback. Uh, and, of course, he writes for The Nation. TheNation.com is the website. Professor Cohen, welcome back to the program. Tom, before we end today... Uh, let's quarrel a little bit. Okay. Because it's not clear to me um, how people such as yourself, who are completely devoted to a progressive agenda in America, to social justice and all those things, cannot pay regular attention to international affairs. Because if we learned anything from the preceding Cold War, Cold War is really bad for progressive agendas. You're right. So the struggle and I'm giving a sermon and I'll stop, but I'm a little agitated about it, not because of you, but for reasons we can talk about later, yeah. uh, that people who are really devoting their lives to a progressive electorate and agenda legislation in America seem to think it can exist apart from whatever happens abroad. Cold War is very bad for progressive agendas. In fact, Cold War can gut it politically, financially, uh, and in various ways. So the link is there, and I think we have to keep an eye on both. Right. And the U.S. and Russia are sliding back into a Cold War, and, and well, we may be in, with China as well. Um, where, do you, where do you want to begin today? Well, let's begin at the beginning. Where What is what is the current situation in Ukraine? Now, I, I've seen assertions um, in the news that we, we have proof positive that the Russians have soldiers there, uh, I think one of the news networks did a an expose where they, uh, you know, were using GPS on pictures and things. Um, on the other hand, well, you tell us. I I should I shouldn't be the talking here. I don't I don't think that's the headline story today. Right. But let me answer it briefly. Yes, of course, there are Russian soldiers in eastern Ukraine. There's a civil war in Ukraine between what's called the Donbas region in eastern Ukraine and the American-backed government in Kiev. Russia has come to the aid of the rebel army in eastern Ukraine, yes, yes. But there are also American troops in Ukraine. Officially, we've been told, there are 300 American troops training Kiev's army, boots on the ground. But there are surely more than 300 militarily-related American personnel in Ukraine. I don't know how many because the United States government won't tell us. But if you take it as a NATO figure, that is the United States plus, we know there are about an equal number of British and Canadian troops. So roughly speaking, a good guess would be in uniform or not in uniform, there are probably about 1,500 at least American-led boots on the ground in Ukraine. If you were to ask me how many Russian soldiers there are on the ground in eastern Ukraine, I would guess at least that number. Probably not more, though. So that's the situation. But can we go to today's headline? Certainly, please. Well, you and I start talking maybe 18 months ago when the Ukrainian crisis began. I said then that this is going to produce a new Cold War. It has. I said the new Cold War, because it's on Russia's borders in Ukraine, not in faraway Berlin, could be more dangerous than the last Cold War and could lead to a kind of Cuban Missile Crisis, eyeball to eyeball, who's going to blink confrontation between Russia and the United States, the United States and NATO. You do. Right. That trajectory, that, that, that fateful, uh, deplorable trajectory, has unfolded almost monthly during the 14 months or so you and I have talked. Yesterday, the new American Secretary of Defense announced that the Pentagon and NATO are going to move 
a considerable amount of heavy military equipment to countries right plunk on Russia's borders, particularly the three Baltic countries, Lithuania, Estonia, and Latvia, but also to several others not far away, including, above all, Poland. Right. Your folks should stop and think. The newspapers say this is the first time this has happened since the end of the Cold War. No, this is the first time this has ever happened in history. Hmm. American forces have never been on Russia's borders. It's true that during the Russian Revolution and Civil War in 1918-1919, there was a small American expeditionary force in Russia. That doesn't count. My uncle, my late uncle, uh, actually was among those soldiers, and he described it to me, and it didn't amount to much. This is serious. So what has happened as of right now, as Tom, as you and I talk, so you're not going to hear this from the New York Times, the Washington Post, or the mainstream uh, broadcast media, is that the Cold War, which has been in, unfolding and institutionalized, both in misinformation and sanctions, economic sanctions, uh, uh, the movement of NATO troops around Russia's borders, in Russia's, near Russia's uh, shores, in the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, in the air, and Russia is doing tit for tat. Uh, doing the same thing. But what happened yesterday with this official announcement of the movement of this American NATO equipment is, is that the Cold War has been escalated in the direction of a hot war with Russia. For this reason, this is a, an extremely provocative step by Washington, moving this equipment there. Russia has made it clear that it will react, respond. It must respond because there's a politics in Moscow. Putin has to do something. He can't be wimp-like about this. Whatever he does won't be good. But whatever he does, then Obama or whoever's running the show in Washington, we don't know, will have to respond to that. So now we have a militarized tit-for-tat that is escalating the Cold War in the direction of hot war, and the Cuban Missile Crisis type of fateful moment, eyeball to eyeball, that I worried about 14 months ago is probably a month or two away. And that's what, as for what's going on in Ukraine, we need to talk about. But note this, that all the information flowing out of the main capitals in the West about these, this NATO and American troop movement never mentions Ukraine any longer. It's all about some alleged... Russian threat to the three small Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and there is none whatsoever. This is pure misinformation, disinformation, propaganda in the sense that it isn't true, and that there are people in the main capitals, Washington, NATO headquarters in Brussels, uh, in Kiev, uh, in Berlin, uh, in Warsaw, who actually want to escalate militarily this crisis. And I've begun to worry, though this is my nightmare and not my certain analysis, that some of these people actually want a military showdown. Amazing. We'll be, uh, Professor Stephen Cohen is with us, contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU and Princeton, the author of Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, which examines the new Cold War, is just out in paperback. Uh, thenation.com is the website. We'll be right back with Professor Cohen. This is the Tom Hartman Program. And to, re to read uh, Professor Cohen's writings, uh, check out thenation.com. Welcome back. Professor Cohen, you said in the next month or two, is it, is it that, what, what, what causes you to come up with that timeline? Well, there, according to Ash Carter, the American Secretary of Defense, uh, who made this announcement yesterday, they're moving the equipment now. Some of the equipment does not have to be shipped from the United States because it's stored in Germany. So one assumes that this American equipment will be on Russia's borders within, I don't know, 
two weeks. Are we talking tanks, missile launchers, what? Keep going. Make your inventory. Everything. Wow. Bear in mind what this is. I mean, I'm sorry to kind of make these headlines that I'm giving you so wordy, but none of this appears in the American press. Nobody's paying any attention. Right. What this is, is another step of NATO expansion toward Russia, which began 20 years ago under Clinton and brought in all these countries on Russia's borders, but did not arm them with NATO military power. That's what they're doing now. But with it comes what we call benign missile defense installations. Now, the Russians, we say this is just a defensive system, which is going to be put in Romania and Bulgaria and, and Poland. Uh, maybe now they'll want to put it in the Baltics. This missile defense system, when it reaches its fourth or fifth stage of development, I'm not sure which, according to Russians and some scientists at MIT, will have the capacity to be an offensive system. That is, it could fire missiles at Russia's retaliatory sites within Russia. So imagine what that's meant, whether we like it or not. What's prevented nuclear war ever since the atomic age or nuclear age began 40 years ago is the knowledge on both sides in Moscow and Washington that if one attacks the other, the one who attacked will be destroyed because the other can retaliate. The Russians are saying that these NATO missile defense systems, which are really American, will have the capacity to wipe out Russia's capacity to retaliate and therefore create in the West a first strike nuclear doctrine. This is reckless. I mean, a mutual assured destruction is an awful concept. Reagan hated it. Gorbachev hated it. So they decided to abolish nuclear weapons. But it kept the nuclear peace. What's going to happen if all this equipment is plunked on Russia's borders? What will Russia do? We don't want to go in this direction. And by the way, this from an American president who said his mission was to abolish nuclear weapons. All he's done is, is spur a new nuclear arms race, which is underway both in the United States and in Russia. All right. We are uh, upgrading very, uh, apparently very rapidly our, our nuclear weapons capability. In fact, well, they call it, they, they, they have a benign word for it. They call it modernization. Right. And Putin says, well, we're modernizing too. And when you get two modernizations, that adds up to a nuclear arms race, a renewed one. Right. And, because and, these are more lethal, more precise. It's no longer the number you have in some ways. It's their capacity uh, for destruction and precision. Right. And, and the introduction of these battlefield nuclear weapons, uh, tactical nuclear weapons. This is... Exactly. Uh, this and, is really... and the fact that both sides are talking about this. Yeah. Yeah. Openly. We'll be right back with Professor Stephen Cohen, contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU in Princeton, author of Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives. You can read about it at thenation.com. Stick around. So last week, uh, the 23rd, the U.S. Department of Defense announced on Tuesday it's indeed planning to bring tanks and other heavy weaponry to Russia's doorstep. This to uh, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, Poland. Um, meanwhile, Sergei Avanov writing relations between Russia and the United States unlikely to improve until the crisis in Ukraine is settled. Nonetheless, U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's recent visit to Russia's Sochi was a positive episode this 21 June. Uh, with us, Professor Stephen Cohen, contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU and Princeton, and author of Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, thenation.com. Professor Cohen, you were just saying that the, the, the our moving heavy equipment into the uh, into these uh, the, these Baltic states, I think they're called, um, from Estonia down to Poland, is provocative to Russia. And uh, within a month or so, this could lead to some sort of an outbreak or some sort of serious problem. Um, what do we do about this, A? And B, um, what, do you, what are your thoughts on, the, uh, Senator, on Secretary of State Kerry's recent trip to, to Russia? Did anything positive come out of that? This is the 
an, an absolutely essential question you just raised. And the answer tells you a lot. At the end of May, Secretary of State Kerry went to Sochi in Russia and met for four hours, focus on that, four hours with President Putin of Russia. This was astonishing in many ways because the official policy of the Obama administration is, and I quote, to isolate Russia. Right. And yet there is Obama Secretary of State sitting there for four hours on videotape, affably having all sorts of discussions with Putin. When it was over, uh, it was made clear both by Putin and by Kerry that the Obama administration had changed its mind and was now going to support what's called the Minsk Accords, which is a program for negotiating peacefully the civil war in Ukraine. Kerry left Sochi, and a day later, a person very close to Vice President Biden told the New York Times they didn't know what Kerry was doing in Sochi. He shouldn't have been there. It was counterproductive. So what you got was what I've told you all along, that there is a split between what I call the war party that thinks you can resolve this crisis by military means and a diplomacy party that thinks it should be negotiated. Kerry had become, in Sochi, the representative of the diplomacy party. He left Sochi and he was gutted by the administration. And the answer to Kerry, we now see with the movement by the Pentagon of these American weapons to Russia's borders, because that's antithetical to negotiation. So the peace party, the diplomacy party, has taken a terrible blow. Meanwhile, uh, the civil war, or the crisis in Ukraine, goes from bad to worse. The American-backed regime in Kiev is in full meltdown, politically, financially. Uh, this neo-fascist uh, battalion called Right Sector has threatened within days to march on Kiev and overthrow the Ukrainian president, Poroshenko, if he doesn't launch a new war against the Russian-backed rebels in, in, in Ukraine. So there is no good news and the party that wants a military showdown with Russia, or at a minimum thinks that this can be solved by escalating the military dimension of the Cold War, is winning on a weekly basis. There is no opposition to it. Now, if you've got two minutes left, we might want to ask why there's no opposition to it. Please. All right. You got to strap yourself in for this now. If you look at everybody who's declared as a presidential candidate, Republican and Democratic, and God, I don't know, what do we got now? Uh, I can't, I've lost 15 that. of them or so, yeah, 20. Every one of them, every one of them, only one has said publicly that the policy toward Putin's Russia is crazy and wrong. Only one has said Putin is doing nothing more than defending in a statesmanlike and rational way Russia's legitimate national interest, and that Putin should be a national security partner for the United States. And now's where you tighten your seatbelt. That one and only presidential candidate is Donald Trump. Right. All right. What does that tell you? Here's what it tells me. All the other candidates, in addition to running against each other, are running against Putin. Hillary Clinton's running against Putin. Jeb Bush is running against Putin. They're all running against Putin. But we know that there are two candidates whose domestic thinking and foreign policy thinking to the extent to which it exists actually does not favor this American policy. There's one in the Republican Party, that's Rand Paul. We know what he thinks about this American overreach, but he doesn't say. The one in the Democratic Party is Senator Sanders, because his program could never be implemented if this Cold War continues to escalate in this military direction. So therefore, I think we have to ask ourselves, why have not Rand Paul and Senator Sanders spoken out and said what they think about this American policy that's leading in a direction that's completely incompatible with their own domestic agendas? Is it fear? Does it, do they think that American voters won't understand and listen? I think they will. So from my point of view, what we need as a nation is for Senator Paul and Senator Sanders to tell us where they stand on this greatest international crisis of our time. You said that there's a schism uh, within the, the administration. 
Uh, right. John Kerry did not go to Sochi without the permission of the president, uh, did he? I mean, isn't isn't the president yes. taking I'm, all of these? I'm the Russia guy. You're the American guy, Tom. Uh, can an American Secretary of State initiate his or her own foreign policy with the American president saying either "Yes, go do this. I support you," or "If you think this is a good idea, go try." But it's on you. I don't know. Yeah. All I know is is that the vice president Biden has been mandated by the President Obama to run this Ukrainian operation. And Obama's people attacked Kerry. And then, of course, Kerry broke his leg, and we haven't seen him since. Right, right. Remarkable, remarkable. Yeah. Professor Cohen, thank you so much for being with us today. And uh, Professor Stephen Cohen, contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU in Princeton. Check out his book, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, thenation.com. Thank you, sir.